Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to A Hoops Journey. This is going to be a special episode. We're going to rewind the clock, so to speak, not to make everybody feel old or out of date, but I think we need to go back and and just sort of realize what uh, Canada as a men's basketball nation has accomplished. We're finally at the level of the women. <laughs> cough, cough. But uh 23 years, it'll be 24 when the Olympics roll around. And I just wanted to, to go back and sit down with as many people from our show that we've had the chance to get to know a little bit, no matter what their career path was, um, whether they made the NBA, whether they played Division One overseas, didn't matter, um, whether they were a coach, player, or manager on that team. I want to go back and just talk about what it meant to them uh, to see Canada qualify, to see them make it through and then still go on a decent run and medal and, and knock off some things that we've never done as a basketball nation um, and do something that we haven't done in a long time. I think it's important and it's important to take advantage of these people, <laughs> not in a bad way, but share their experiences. Uh, maybe give a little advice to these Canadians who are going to head to the Olympics um, and then start to figure out how the heck I'm going to make it to Paris. Um, if anybody has any ideas or they have a flight for me, let me know. Um, so we're going to talk with uh, a few former players, head coach Jay Triano, former coach, head coach of the team, um, Johnny Lee, the manager who was there, who we've had on the show, and uh, a gentleman who's really involved with the media uh, the last couple of weeks over in Jakarta and Manila and has done a fantastic job of getting out stories and podcasting and writing for and on behalf of Canada basketball. So I think this is going to be a great episode. There'll be one that you can have a park side to and just sort of listen and hear people reflect, but also hear the pride that they have as Canadians and the pride that they have in our national team. The fact that they were able to do what they did. Um, it's no small feat, but I think now that we've done it, it's time to take the next step again. And I'm excited. I'm someone who's a former player, Never got the chance to wear the maple leaf, but got close. Um, and now coaching and still involved in the game, it brought a lot of pride to me. I was down in Birch Bay uh, watching the game in the morning, fighting Eli for the TV. Um, and when they were able to get through Spain, I can't lie, a couple of tears crossed uh, down my eyes because uh, it was meant a lot. And I want people to jump on and I want them to have the same emotions. I want them to have the same feelings I want them to take pride in Canada basketball the same way they do the Vancouver Canucks, the Seattle Seahawks, the Toronto Blue Jays, the Edmonton Oilers, whatever it is, the Chicago Cubs for me, have the same pride. Wear the jersey or the t-shirt or the hoodie with the same amount of uh, love and desire that you have for these American, North American, European soccer league. Doesn't matter. Whatever it is and who you cheer for, do the same that you do for Canada because there's no shame in it and there's no shame anymore. That's for sure. If you felt shame before because you didn't think we were going to qualify or we'd get upset or a bad loss would happen, it ain't going to be that way anymore. We've got young superstars and our program's going to be in the mix for a long time. So get on the Canada basketball website, purchase some gear, get something from Walmart, make Canada Day special for you if you haven't or you don't. And really dive into Canada basketball and, and and do it with pride. If you're a follower of this podcast, you should probably have basketball as a big part of your life in some form. And it's okay to have the same pride um, for Canada basketball as you did anything else. I remember talking to myself about, am I going to wake up? And I said to myself, I was like, Mitch, you know what? You got up to watch the gold medal hockey game. I can't even remember where it was, Italy or something, one uh, one year when we won the gold. And I was like, you don't even know how to skate, bro. <laughs> if you can't get up at 1.30 or 4.30 in the morning to cheer on the best um, men's Canadian basketball athletes we have in the country for the, your favorite sport in the world, you're not even a fan. So I hope everyone enjoys this episode. And I hope come Olympic time, you can step out of your house, get together with your friends, set the alarm, whatever it is, go to the pub, make a party out of it and be proud of what we've done. Um, because we're going in the right direction and there's a lot of people involved, not even a 2000 people, Nate Mitchell, who was on staff, Phil Scrub currently, 
I mean, obviously we've got the radar and some of the guys right now would love to have them on the show. So many people, Scott Morrison, Roy Rana, I'm, I'm going to miss people for sure that have been involved um, with Canada basketball that we've had on the show or we haven't had on the show. There's so many hands in it and that's the Canadian way. So have a Parkside, tip some maple syrup and uh, we know you'll enjoy this special edition of Canada basketball episode. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, our next guest today is uh, someone who not necessarily was connected with the 2000 team, but a guy who's really dove into Canada basketball here. I've connected with in the last month or so here as we've been following along Canada's journey. Um, he was unable due to uh, some school and life uh, issues to make it all the way to Manila, but he was in there for the uh, the first bit in uh, Jakarta, following the team, doing podcasting pretty much after every game. Um, he's got a little podcast himself as well, uh, which he can talk a little bit about if he wants. It's called Behind the Play. I know he's got a big guest in Ron McLean coming up here soon. Um, and uh, just a guy that we, we DMing on Twitter for what seems like a long time now, but uh, sharing stories. And we want to hear his experience about what it was like to be following the team and and uh, how he feels about going forward. Also, the ups and downs of being on the media side, but also being a fan. We have none other than Mr. Alex Adams with us. How you doing, man? Great. Thanks so much for having me. I love uh, a hoops journey. I've uh, been uh, kind of found you uh, the past couple, like the past year and uh, love the show. I loved your episode with uh, uh, Jimmy uh, Derue, or I don't know if I said that right, but uh, yeah. from Ottawa, so that, like, I'm from Ottawa, of course, so a little auto connection there, um, but uh, really excited to be on and uh, it was pretty cool uh, covering this team. So thanks so much for having me on. No worries, man. Um I mean, it must have been a whirlwind. I know that you experienced the emotions of it all. Um, I don't know yeah. how you did it. You're a young dude, so you're able to, you know, get a report out after games, but also just the highs and lows and the emotions of, you know, being a Canada basketball fan and following the game and the team for so long and knowing that the peaks and valleys have been a plenty since 2000. Um, as you've had a few days to get home and relax, but also get into school mode, have you done any reflection on your experience? And I mean, I guess from a, a personal standpoint, how was it? And also a professional standpoint, learning and growing yourself. Um, what were the things that you learned? So you got lots to uh, to share. Yeah, to unpack. Um, I'd say firstly, just what an experience for me personally. I was very lucky to, to go over to Jakarta and, and be part of the media. Um, it kind of came, happened, uh, chance just on a whim um, I don't know if people know who Scott Witter is, but uh, he's a big in the Canada basketball kind of Twitter space. And he just suggested when they the original roster was announced uh, to apply for media credentials. I did it on a whim. A week and a half later, I got the yes. OK, I'm like, oh, my God, this is happening. Uh, booked my flights, uh, accommodation. And it was just very quick, uh, did a, a lot of work for Raptors Republic, which was really, really cool to, you know, kind of really feel in the media space. I've been doing podcasts for a long time, like yourself. And, uh, you know, I've had cool people in the basketball world, but I've been a, such a big fan of this program. I still remember being 12 and remember they lost to Lebanon. I still remember that somehow. <laughs> Uh, and then, and then Kelly Olenek, and then very vividly remember how excited I was in 2015. And we, we, we don't talk about how that ended. Uh, <laughs> and then obviously in 2021, I think I might have had, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> just an anxiety attack <laughs> when, when Wiggins hit that shot and then uh, it all went to doom and it just felt like, uh, you know, take, you know, taking the, um, the, the, the loss out of the jaws of victory in, in, that, in 2021 and 2020, or 2015. So um, to be there, and to, I was just, I felt I was watching the same movie all over again against Spain. I'm sure if you can look back at my Twitter timeline, uh, I was not optimistic. I felt I was all doom and gloom and I shouldn't have been maybe because uh, we have a player like Shea Gildas Alexander and Tom Brooks. And just to be around those guys day in and day out was uh, pretty, pretty cool. Um, I don't think I've met or been around someone as, you know, cool and calm as uh, 
as Shea Gilchrist Alexander. Uh, yeah. I talked to him after the game against Brazil, and it was like he lost game 37 in Detroit uh, <laughs> back to back. It was not a big deal for him. Uh, all is well. And then there's obviously the video of him hitting the, those shots against the USA and, and the one I think of against Spain where the big shot over Clever to, to go up in that game after the big comeback and he's going to the bench and he's just putting his hand down saying, calm, calm, you know, nothing, yeah. the job isn't done. And wow, I'd be uh, probably jumping up in the air like <laughs> Miller against the Bulls in the 90s. I think that'd be my reaction after a that kind of game. So um, all in all was really cool. Uh, shout out to Rash Madani. He was amazing to me. Legend. Yeah. Learned so much from him. Cool. Uh, very funny guy uh, behind the scenes. So if you ever get the chance to, to get to know him, but very kind with his time and uh, just being around the players, I had, you know, talked to Jordy Fernandez one-on-one. -on -one. I have a lot of stories, so I won't go into them all right now, but it was, yeah. it was pretty surreal experience and something I'll remember for the rest of my life. That's awesome. And I think it's cool that you're touching on um, because the sense through the TV was the same was like, I kept watching the games and going, all right, when's the panic button going to hit? And they all just seemed pretty like, and I guess it was kind of like the Kelly demeanor and the Shea demeanor and Jordy, right? Just such a, hey, this is part of the process. And I'm sure they talked about every angle. We're talking about the pros of pros, right? I mean, you got first team all NBA, but just to see it in action, and I mean, good that he did put his hand because when it came to the USA game, like the four points at the end, like if we weren't in a good mental and emotional space, um, who knows what would have happened, right? And and I think it says a lot about that group and the ability to bounce back after that Brazil game. You know, it's like, what were we, 19 and a half favorite or something yeah. like that? Yeah, and then just that, sort right? of, yeah. And, and, and the slow starts and it was just, nothing really seemed to to bother them, you know? And then you've got, You've got like Phil Scrubs in the bronze medal game, subbing in, you know, he, hitting big shots in the in the pool. Like just a, a good experience, a good group of guys and and pretty fun. What was the environment like, the atmosphere? Um, I had a couple of buddies who were there. They were saying it wasn't a lot of local fans, um, yeah. but it was a lot of just people from out of town and stuff. But I mean, I'm sure you've experienced an NBA game before, but sitting there and then also going through the ups and downs of FIBA ball, which is like, Oh yeah. Yeah. One, one, that, one day it foul is one thing. <laughs> one day it fouls another, right? Like just all of that. But the game is much quicker too, right? So it's mm. you know, I mean, must have been some, some pretty interesting times. Yeah, expand yeah. on those a bit. Yeah, no, uh the Latvians really brought it. Um and I, I became friends with a lot of their media and they just packed the house and it felt as though it was a home crowd. So when Canada went down 23, 13 in that first quarter against Latvia, it really felt like like a playoff game in the NBA and everything's going wrong. And uh, it's really kind of put up or shut up time in terms of your adversity <laughs> as a team. And uh, they definitely came back in that game pretty impressively. Um, and as you said, it, it wasn't, I'd said that the France Canada game had really good atmosphere it was sold out. And that was a lot of locals um, as well. Um, so the, the, the Spain, the Latvia game and the, the France game were really well attended and the atmosphere felt closer to an NBA game or even in some cases a playoff game. Mm -hmm. uh, so really good, I would say against Lebanon and, and uh, Brazil, maybe a bit less so. But uh, mm -hmm. overall, those were probably the most well-attended games, um, maybe aside from France, Latvia, which was really a, a cool atmosphere as well and, and great game. So um, the fans were pretty fair weather, if I'm going to be honest. Um, I was going to say the Dylan Brooks experience. It seemed like one day. So, so I have, was, I, yeah. yeah. So he, they were <laughs> booing him in the first game against France. Yeah. Uh, like they, they said his name in, in the lineup and they said, boo. And then by the end of the game, it's MVP chance. I've never seen <laughs> that ever. And then it, it seemed as though that translated to Manila where that happened again, because in, for people that don't know Philippines, it's like everyone is a Lakers fan. Yeah. So obviously they don't like Dylan Brooks for, for the playoffs this year. And he was getting an MVP chance, although that one, you know, putting 39 points on uh, the USA, I think you deserve some uh, MVP chance um, comparatively yeah. to maybe some of the games in Jakarta. But uh, those two just led the way. And um, I will say for like a little tidbit on, on Dylan yeah. Brooks, his shooting in the practices, like oh, we got access to the last five, 10 minutes. 
he was Canada's best shooter from three. Mm. Uh, now that doesn't mean that you shoot 58% or 59% from three in the tournament, yeah. but he was their best shooter, which wasn't really the knock on him as a, as a lights out shooter, mm-hmm. but watching him every day, he, he was shooting better than Kelly or Nikhil or Shea from three. So um, definitely can tell he put the, the hard work in and uh, man, oh man, I, I thought that Spain game could be top, but maybe the, the USA game did in a lot of ways as well. So just what a tournament. And like, I think about you and all the guys that you're going to be interviewing from the team and, and how much it must have meant to them. And, you know, I got a bit emotional, but just seeing Dwight Powell after the game and he's, yeah, I said, awesome. I said, Dwight, like, let's, let's talk. Like, what does it mean? And he's like, I can't. And you could see he was getting visibly, um, you know, emotional. And then RJ, uh, some people probably maybe saw the video of, of it that I took of him dancing up and down. So he was very excited. So overall, um, it was pretty cool to, to be there for, for Canada making the Olympics for the first time since 2000, uh, pretty, pretty something I'll always remember. And, uh, it all felt so surreal. I just remember that, that, that the France game when they won and, and that Spain game, I was, I was at a loss for words and, and that's maybe why those podcasts <laughs> don't, don't listen to them too, too closely because I, I <laughs> really didn't put out my best performance. I was uh, all over the place. I think I hit you with a few like relaxed gifs in the, yeah. in the DM. I was like, yo man. And I'm like, this guy is literally sitting in the ups and downs right now. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's like f- 5 AM for me. So I'm half asleep, but no, I mean, and it's hard not to, right? I mean, when you get emotionally invested and that's the love of sport. And before I touch on the next point, just I think Tim McAuliffe made a great tweet yeah. after he was about Dylan Brooks and he was talking about like, don't get caught up in meme culture, right? Like Dylan Brooks and I have group chats with, with friends and kids that I coach that are young men now. They're like, oh, he's going to China and he's going overseas. And I'm like, this guy can play. Like I, I'm not necessarily like the hugest fan because he's not on my team, the T-Wolves, but like, he's going to add value. Like, what are we talking about here? And and I think it's just because he was one of the first to actually be like, you know what? I'm not afraid of LeBron. And like, who knows? Maybe he is kind of, but like nobody else speaks like that. So he put himself out there, which I think is awesome, which is what we need. We need more of that in the NBA. I think like, I just think there's a lot of, yeah. And, And then it was just like, all of a sudden he's just this bummy basketball player. I'm like, are you kidding me? Like, this is what he does for a living people, you know? And I, so I think, he might not admit it. And I saw a couple of interviews with him, but I think it probably was for him like a bit of a, ah, and he used that FIBA experience to do that. A guy like Kelly too, right? Just sort of not the pressure of having to do it during the NBA season, but to be able to get it done in that. And now going into training camp, just with that extra confidence is going to be so huge, you know? It's going to be such an intriguing storyline of what Dylan Brooks looks like for Houston this year. I, yeah. I keep thinking like that might be, I'm 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 a big Raptors fan, but just as an NBA head, that is something I'm going to be looking at those first maybe 10, 15 games is how much translates of of this of the performance he had for Canada. Because the one thing I totally agree with everything you said, my gripe and my worry was just the shot selection. And mm. sure, I, I don't think, as I said, not going to shoot 58 percent from three in the NBA, but he for the most part he took in like you know he took a bunch of a couple tough shots, but for the most part, when he made those seven threes against the U S it was, they were wide open. They were catch and shoot from Shea. It's like, well, if it's not him ball hogging or, or taking dumb shots, he took a couple step backs, Sure. But he wasn't just chucking. And that's what he kind of did for uh, Memphis. And that was the big worry on this team is like, mm-hmm. is RJ him, like a guy, guys that shoot a lot. And in the end, um, man, oh man, he was the perfect player. He, he should have been on the, the all, you know, uh, the second team all tournament or whatever, but he won defensive player of the yeah. tournament. And that's something those, all those haters who said go to China or whatever is he was an all NBA or an all defensive type player. And, you know, yeah. even if he's a mediocre offensive player, if he's bringing that type of defense consistently, um, he just had big defensive player after big defensive play. Yeah. And if it wasn't for some FIBA officiating, maybe he would have been even more impactful, but he's still one defensive player of the year. Yeah. So part of the tournament. So just one, well, it's, it's interesting too, like just to see the reaction of the U S now and just some people, you know, I've seen some stuff from Gilbert arenas and JJ Redick was chirping today and some other people. And I saw Kuzma tweet, but like, okay, you didn't send your best guys, 
did you actually think like, are you really that disrespectful to the rest of the world or did they just know? Right. But, but I'm like, Kuzma's tweet was actually on point because he was basically like, we need some people who don't need the ball. We need some people who are going to guard like Dylan Brooks. And because you look at these teams, like, I mean, Germany props to them, but I was like, Serbia is freaking unreal, man. Like this is a well-oiled machine and they didn't lose anything when they went up to the bench. Right. Like, Mm -hmm. and uh, to be honest, I didn't know half the dudes like, you know what I mean? And, but they just know how to hoop and they know a role. And so like you've talked about is Brooks's mindset has always been defensive, but there were times where we were streaky from the three point line and we needed guys like Nikhil had some good games from the line. And then he had a couple of games that were not so good. Right. And he stepped in when he needed to, but I just, uh, it's been an interesting since it's finished the opinions and thoughts that are coming out and we're like, Oh, the U S is going to go and roll. Well, good. Then do your thing, but don't oh. overlook the rest of the world. And it ain't like, it's not the NBA. It's a totally different game. And I hope a lot of fans that followed really took that way and understood that it is a different brand of basketball. And basketball isn't a one-on-one game. It's, it's yeah. not just talent. It's about teamwork. It's right. Like that's why Serbia beat Canada. It's not that, because they've had more talent than Canada, you know, player yeah. for player at the same time. I think that it's a new age of, of basketball and, and men's basketball. Mm-hmm. Like you look at obviously the U S lost in all four, they had those amazing Spanish teams that really they went head to head in the mm-hmm. late 2000s, early 2010s. But just it's a global game. You look at the top five in MVP. There was one American. There's Shea, uh, Giannis, Jokic, MB. I mean, MB, sure, he's American. I don't really think so, but uh, <laughs> Americans uh, want him now. But it's it's a global game, right? And mm-hmm. times are changing. And sure, like the U.S. can send LeBron, KD, these all-star teams, obviously they'll have more talent, but they'll have absolutely no continuity. And you look at in, in just in the Olympic final, right? The U S almost lost a couple of games. They barely beat France. They lost to France earlier in that tournament, barely beat France. France had three NBA players, right? Right. And if you look forward to Canada, even if they added Jamal Murray or an Andrew Wiggins, you'd imagine the core of this team who just went through the trials and tribulations of this tournament will be together, right? All seven NBAers are going to be there if the barring injuries. Um, so I think we have a big leg up on them and sure the U S might be more talented, but it's not like we're bringing scrubs off, uh, you know, no, <laughs> no pun intended to fill, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> but just yeah. Mal Murray, SGA, RJ Barrett, Dylan Brooks and FIBA, FIBA Brooks, right? These, these guys are really, really good. And the USA honestly got really lucky that that game was close. Um, uh, yeah, like uh, on a sa- Sunday, like Canada easily, if they probably don't go to the bench early in, in that first quarter, uh, and give up, I think Zach Eady was minus 15 in two minutes. I love Zach Eady. Great, great mm-hmm. quote. Really seemed like a really nice guy being around there, but, um, Canada with a bit more depth, probably wins that game by 15. Right. Mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. So uh, I just think the sky's the limit for this program. And I, I'm just so excited for Paris. I'm looking at flights and tickets and everything. Let's go. So I'm, uh, I'm dropping the seeds in my wife's brain too. She's not, she's, you know, it's like little subtle things and I'm waiting for her to really process the fact that I'd like to go to Paris for about five, six days in the summer, but Maybe we can make it a family in trip. Lille, for for people that don't know, just uh, the the group games are in Lille, which is a bit south, and then it goes to Paris. Just for uh, people that are are planning their books or their trip uh, for next you year, so you don't you don't go to Paris and overpriced Olympic, and then find out, oh oh, it's in, it's in Lille, a <laughs> new place. So, anyways, yeah. <laughs> I mean, Paris is beautiful in the summer, but still, yeah. If you're going to watch hoops, you might want to go to the right venue. <laughs> Uh, last question before you, before you go and thanks for being with us, man. And, um, you know, we, you, leading off what's going to be a great episode and chopping it up with some, some legends of Canada basketball. Um, you've obviously seen the landscape. You're fully invested. I was taking some dads on a, we try the last Thursday of the month. We go up to the local pub, we walk up and we just have a, a dad beer right after all the kids are in bed and chat. And you know, they're pretty big sports fans. And so I was telling them about the upcoming FIBA World Cup. This is a couple of weeks ago. And just talking about like, why is there not the same passion? Now, I get it. Hockey is the sport, right? I mean, it should be lacrosse, but I mean, hockey is the sport. But how do we get to a point where is it is it because we just haven't had the global superstar like a Shea? But I mean, he's so low key too. How mm-hmm. do we get? We've never had more kids playing basketball in this country. 
our women's program has set the standard ahead of the men for a long time. And, but I still feel like, I don't know if you get what I'm saying, that pride and just that, like, yeah, we all say we're, we're proud to be Canadian, but I'm like, I want someone sitting next to me who's crying too when we beat Spain. You know what I mean? Like, is, is that invested and not because they played or what just, just fans. I don't know. What are your thoughts on that? And how far off am I on that? I just, it, it kind of, no, no, it kind of irks me a bit, you know? And it's like, I'm a Blue Jays fan. I'm like, great. How many Canadians are on the Blue Jays or whatever? But I'm just like, we have Team Canada playing for us, right? I don't know. No, uh, to go off that, I think, the, the, and we see it with the U.S., the World Cup is not a big thing for, for North Americans, right? I mean, the time difference doesn't help as well. <laughs> for me, I, I think about people who have kind of gotten contact with me throughout me covering this team and they talk about how much 2000 and to you know go off your all your interviews then uh you know i'm very fortunate that i'm one of them somehow but uh <laughs> just the fact that that was their inspiration to to cover this team or watch them or be so invested right and think about that that team they had steve nash of course who became an mvp but wasn't at the time mm -hmm. uh, todd mccullough and all the guys that you're going to have on but in 2024, we're going to have SGA who after this year might be, I don't know if he's an MVP, can't, he's, if he's going to win the MVP, but he's probably going to be top five in MVP or close to yeah. Jamal Murray, uh, RJ Barrett. It's going to be all these NBA guys, Dylan Brooks, who's just, you know, got captivated, you know, Canada in, in so many ways after this performance. The Olympics is where people care and watch. Yeah. And if Canada is able to and just even go to the Olympics and have all these NBA players, there's so many people that are Raptors fans that aren't Canada basketball fans, but they know the NBA, right? They know who Shea Gildas Alexander, they know Andrew Wiggins or Jamal Murray or Archie Barrett, Dylan Brooks. Yeah. To see them all suit up and play at the Olympics, I think is going to be such a big change mm -hmm. for this program and, and for years to come. And I think, It'll be such a great stepping point into, you know, Los Angeles, where it's a bit closer for Canadians. Maybe you in the West Coast can can go down and check them out. So I think 2024 and, and beyond is really where we're going to see. Maybe it's not going to be for the World Cup like what it is um, for the Soccer World Cup or hockey. But people are going to be like, hey, this matters. This is important. We need to be at the Olympics. And, you know, there's a decent chance Canada could come back with a medal and man, oh man, you look at the women's soccer and how much that's elevated through them achieving at the Olympics. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's what we're going to see after 2024. And just even the lead up where, you know, Brian Windhorst talks about a home and home with the U.S. and Toronto and, and Vegas. Uh, yeah. that's, that's nice to me. And uh, please give me credentials. Um, so uh, <laughs> that that's 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 what where I see it. And I think this was a great stepping stone. You talk about the USA win. Mm -hmm. Right. If I, I keep thinking it might have been better for this program to win a bronze while beating the USA than even maybe winning a gold because of mm -hmm. what kind of how it demonstrates to the rest of the world or to the rest of Canada that we beat the USA in basketball, in mm -hmm. men's basketball. That, you know, that's just pretty cool to think about. And um, I don't think it's going to be the last time we beat the US in, in a major tournament. Maybe Steve. I'm being hypothetical, but. Uh, I think that's that's where we're going for the next. I'm not saying we're going to dominate them. That's no, that's you, not but, what you're saying. I hear you. Yeah. So spoke spoken like a veteran. Look at this guy, poised <laughs> under pressure. He's got all the right words. That's awesome, man. Um, mm -hmm. Listen, we'll make sure in like whatever it is, nine months when the podcast still roll and you're doing your thing, we'll do a little uh, pre-tournament discussion for and sure. we'll talk because you never know. Like we'll see where the team's at. We can discuss a few things, but continued success to you, man. I mean, you're a fantastic young journalist. You're doing a great job. I know you have other things that on your plate, but I thought the coverage that you were able to give was so super special and great. And uh, you mean, there's other great guys that you mentioned too, but I think to have more is, is awesome. And um, who knows, maybe Hoops Journey can get some credentials for the Olympics. I don't know. Maybe I could pull a few strings as well. And we can, uh, to, man. It, we can rub uh, elbows and analyze the game tough, like we're coaching it. I will, I will say you can probably rub elbows for a game if there's a game in out west or in uh, Toronto. I think you could definitely do that for sure for some pre-tournament games. Um, so I hope that that happens. And thanks so much for the kind words. I, I love the podcast. 
I miss your your music intros. I was expecting one today. So <laughs> oh, that's, that, the, we, that's the that's the editing process, not we, to worry. Okay, okay. We yeah, saved yeah. that for Steve Nash and uh and <laughs> piano. That's that's what I'm hearing. Uh, but uh thanks so much, Aaron, uh for for having me on. a uh, huge fan of the show. Um and uh, uh always, you know, whenever, hopefully uh We'll have a, a post mortem in uh, 2024 when Canada's won the gold medal. That's what I keep saying when they win the gold medal at the Olympics. So we'll I love see. it. We'll see. But thanks so much for having me on. You got it, man. Where can people reach out? Where can they follow you? You yeah, know, where so, their little um, adventures, man. Give yourself a plug. So I'm you're, doing be good, at, you're doing good work. Uh, uh, I'm going to be at Raptors Republic. So doing a bunch of Raptors stuff in, in Canada basketball too. Obviously um, the season ends for Canada basketball now. So uh, less stuff, but um, you can find my work there. And then I'll have um, a lot of hockey and, and basketball people on my behind the play podcast. Follow me at Twitter at Alex Adams BTB, which is uh, the acronym for behind the play. Um, I'll have cool people in the basketball world. I'm hoping well, fingers crossed for like a Brian Windhorse or Ramona Shelburne, some other pretty big names in, in the basketball world. And then obviously a, a lot of Canadian journalists as well. So um, thanks for for letting me shamelessly plug myself. Oh, and good, man. Uh, and uh, thanks so much for having me and, and check me out. And if you ever have questions, feel free to DM me. Uh, my DMs are open and uh, uh, like and, and follow anything I, I put out. So I appreciate your uh, your support, Aaron, and uh, love the, the show. And uh, can't wait to to listen to the the rest with all the big hitters and then myself. So I'm excited to to listen to the rest of the show. You got it, man. And thanks for helping me kick it off. Um, I did a little bit of a personal rant to start and then having you jump in and just someone who was right there, you know, building off the momentum, of what happened and, and thanks to you for helping grow the game. I mean, I think it can't be overlooked, right? That's why it's important is that the, the more people that we have, you know, with all the guests that we've had on this show, they all say, you know, just kind of like, thank you. And I don't really look at it like that, but I guess from their perspective, it makes sense to me that we are trying to just help grow the game and share the game and make it better in our country. So you're a big part of that too, man. So thanks and keep your energy up because we need it because the old dogs like me uh, not going to be around forever. So continued success and good luck with school this year and we'll, we'll keep in touch. What can we say about the people at Parkside, especially our guy, Sam Payne, a huge supporter of basketball in our community. The gentleman does many things behind the scenes that people don't know about. And one of those is supporting our podcast from literally day one. Sam reached out to us and said, hey, I like what you're doing. How do we get involved? And what you can do is find them at any local government store or come down to the brewery, sit on the patio, sit in the back, listen to the music, come for music trivia night, whatever it is. The wide variety of beer that they offer is second to none. And Port Moody in the Brewer's Row is a great place to be. We are so appreciative of Parkside Brewery, we can't even say it in enough words. Head down, we hope to see Parkside, and if you can't, find a way to support, because they do a lot for us. Cheers. As we go down and revisit uh, the year 2000, the Olympics, and talk with the former guests and um, some some new people about uh, what it means to Canada basketball to qualify again 23 years later. It'll be 24 by the time the Olympics come around. And um, upon my own personal reflection, it's been great to realize that we had the opportunity to sit down and talk with so many guys from that special team. And today we have episode 31, which is crazy. Um, 31, Mr. Peter Garashi with us today. How are you, sir? And what is going on? I'm good, Aaron. Thanks for having me. Uh, again, thank you for continuing this uh, podcast. It makes a lot of Canadian basketball players proud. I have a lot of friends who um, are kind of in the basketball community and listen in and they they just love hearing stories about some of the some of the people they can connect with. So thank you for that. Life is good here in Kelowna. Just get the school year started and uh, soon enough be back on the uh, sidelines coaching uh, senior girls at KSS. Had a boy, man. A good thing, uh, senior girls. You don't have much of a hairline, anyways, so that's good. You'll be good. Um, <laughs> <laughs> now, someone who's you know you you stayed involved with Canada basketball this past summer, um, and have probably been off and on periodically. But as you saw or heard or whatever the highlights, or maybe you were watching the game and you see Spain go down 
um, after us being down, you know, double digits, but fighting back and staying the course and able to knock them off and qualify for the Olympics for the first time since a team that you were on, what were some of the feelings and emotions that went through you? Uh, that Spain game was pretty stressful to watch because I mean, <laughs> we went down twice, double digits and, uh, just the way FIBA works. Sometimes it's, it usually comes down to a do or die game. You don't really cakewalk into any situation unless you're top one or two in one of the world events. So it's very challenging just to get into these major events. Uh, but to, to watch us grind our way back from double digits, uh, twice, I believe at the end of, obviously the end of the half. And then I think the beginning of the third, we might've been down 12. Mm -hmm. Um, you, you could just see that the guys really, really wanted it. And it wasn't always pretty at times, but they had to kind of enforce their will, especially on the defensive end. Uh, I cannot lie. Like when we came down the, the final stretch there and, and getting that win, like I was pretty emotional. Mm -hmm. Um, of course, just sitting by myself, uh, watching on the laptop, uh, don't want anybody around me, but, uh, yeah, yeah pretty, pretty, I don't emotional. think anybody wanted to be around you either. Buddy, <laughs> so. I wasn't, a, I wasn't good company. That's for sure. But it, yeah, it's, it was hard to keep tears out of the eyes just to realize that they did it. And, uh, and especially kind of, uh, it was really cool just to imagine what they were experiencing in that locker room, because I was fortunate enough to have that, a uh, very similar experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know. And it's, it's, and I and I'm I hope we get to a point where it doesn't have to be this emotional for everyone. <laughs> you know, it yeah, can just be a, right. a regular thing. But I think the hard work and the effort of so many uh, for you guys to get there, right? Um, we're going to sit down with Johnny Lee, right, Jay, and some of your teammates, um, and all that effort and all the people that you know that others don't know behind the scenes. But I think we have a better perspective with social media and all that. We know how many people it really does take a village. Um, was there anything else other than the locker room or, you know, like, what are you thinking about these guys and, and what they're about to witness at the Olympic experience? Uh, you know, I, I have to say for us in 2000, we went down there, we had maybe one, maybe zero uh, representatives from the media follow us because yeah. we weren't expected to do anything. Mm -hmm. uh, Steve Nash was just kind of like on the uptick, starting to kind of make his uh, footprint in you know, in worldwide basketball. So, um, there wasn't that much pressure. I think half the team barely knew we were even playing for a spot in the Olympics. When we came to that game, it was like, it kind of <laughs> came upon us. It's like, wow, we win this one, beat Puerto Rico and Puerto Rico. We're going to the Olympics. Oh, let's yeah. go give it our best shot. It was kind of like, we weren't really <laughs> thinking much. This yeah. team has had like over a decade of pressure. Right. Yeah. And, um, some of these players that have played through it, like the Kelly Lennox and the, and the pals and Brooks off and on. And, um, you know, they've had to deal with that pressure of achieving this moment. So for them to come through and to, to perform at that moment, I, I think it was not to take anything away from the 2000 team, but I think this mm -hmm. team had to deal with a, a, just a different dynamic, especially with the way social media is nowadays. You, you, you are hearing about whether you are succeeding or failing. And, uh, but this group, just to see them come through. I was uh, like, I followed pretty much every game they played this summer from exhibition to um, their bronze medal game against the U S and the way they were playing basketball from the beginning to the end, they, they improved on both ends of the court. Uh, I got to say kudos to the coaching staff because this mm -hmm. team just kept getting better. The FIBA game is a different game. Um, there, it takes some figuring out, there's no doubt we have the athletes and the skills and the the ability, but the um, the mental part and the way the games play, the way the games officiated is totally different. Mm -hmm. And I saw the growth in our players and our team, uh, like throughout the entire summer through the process. Then that and without that growth, they would not have qualified. So it was really, really cool to see everything come together in that moment. Yeah, and I I think you make such a good point. Is just sort of the coaching staff and their just their body language throughout it all. It just never really like I was, well, I'd like to see a heart rate monitor on Jordy, you know, like just sort of, I and I think that filtered through the guys in, and it, cause some of you're younger. And like you mentioned the Dwight's and the, and the Linux that have been grinding through it, you know, Phil, um, but even a guy like RJ, you know, when he was younger, they had the opportunity yeah. to knock off the U S at that level. And so he's probably thinking about all those memories and moments. And, um, I, I just thought the composure was great and, and you make such good points, um, about 
just like it was so good. I know the game times are not ideal for fans, but just you get a real sense of what FIBA basketball is like if you've never really seen it, right? Because there were so many ups and downs in those games with foul trouble, just different things. Luca gets yes. tossed, Brooks gets tossed. Right. Like it's just, it's a, it can, it's a gong show, right? It can be a yeah. real gong show, depending. And right. and you and I mean, you're talking about a casual group going, oh, let's just beat Puerto Rico in Puerto Rico. But I remember watching that game and being like, yeah. they might, they might not make it out alive tonight if they win, <laughs> right? Like, <laughs> yeah. It's a different, it's a different animal. And, um, I, I, I think the, the biggest thing is like, you have to adapt to it. And I think that's what the coaching staff did. You talked about, like, I don't know if, uh, Jordy just seemed so composed and kind of calm on the sideline. And I think there was definitely a message through his players, not to, uh, bicker at the officials and to get on the officials. He was going to do all that. You could see that. I don't know if you saw their game against Slovenia. Slovenia was all over the officials. Oh from, my like, God. The, the Luka was just like. The, to the team manager. It was just like, guys, <laughs> like it became kind of gross basketball. It did. Right? It I really did. I did not enjoy watching that, even though there was tons of talent on the court. Yeah. But um, yeah, I can't, I can't say enough to this, uh, this group. So it's, it's just really, really exciting to see. I'm excited about our future. I it's, uh, it's interesting because I think we have a team that was capable of winning gold at this world cup. And uh, we technically, there are a couple of pieces we could add to make us even stronger, right? Mm -hmm. So it, it should be, uh, it'll be interesting to see how this uh, transpires for the Olympics. For sure. Um, so well-spoken, man, great stuff. I love it. Uh, before we let you go, I just have one question. I've been kind of asking all the guests is um, just think about your time with the national team, the experiences that you had, the ups, downs, and then finally, you know, being able to qualify for the Olympics there. Uh, what advice would you give to anyone involved that gets the opportunity to go over there? Um, is there a little bit of advice that you would want to hand out, whether they listen to it or not? But uh, yeah, I know, mean, what, what would it be? Yeah, my advice, honestly, would be this is an opportunity of lifetime. It doesn't uh, don't embrace it when you're at the Olympics. Start embracing it now. Uh, do whatever you have to do. Eat right. Get your sleep. Take care of your body. Uh, you know, get your mental patterns, your thinking on the right track. Uh, make sure you're making decisions every day so that you could set up yourself for an incredible experience at the Olympics. Um, I'll have to say like the, the summer before the Olympics, I decided I wasn't going to have a drop of uh, alcohol. So I didn't have a beer, didn't have a, didn't have a drink. Uh, whether it helped me or not, I don't know, probably did, but yeah. I'm just happy that I made that decision at that time. Now, as soon as the Olympics was done, <laughs> that was a different story. So, but um, it's, it's just those kind of things. Whatever works for you, don't um, don't take it for granted. Just it's mm -hmm. one year of your life. If you have to commit yourself to a specific uh, workout routine, diet routine, whatever it is, it's worth doing it now because uh, you know I say to this day, like for anybody involved in sports, I wish that uh, let's say it this way: I wish that anybody who plays sports could experience the Olympics because. Mm. It's just, uh, it's, it's unique and it's a, it's a special thing to go through. So I, I, uh, I hope these guys make the right decisions leading up to it. I love it, man. Awesome. I appreciate you. Thank you for being with us. Um, like you said, I too was watching and just as a fan and, and a hoop head, just sort of when I saw that final buzzer go, I couldn't believe it. And my wife and mother-in-law were sitting there looking at me like, what's wrong with you? And I was just like, I can't, <laughs> I can't, I just can't explain to you. So uh, it's awesome to see the nation and I'd love to see even more momentum and more excitement um, and, and more support like we support, you know, the Raptors and the Blue Jays or whatever yeah. it is um, and really just rally behind the the men and women here. So thanks for being yeah. with us, buddy. Yeah, yeah go ahead. you're welcome. Yeah. I, thanks for having me on here. I love your passion for the game. I mean, more the biggest thing I just wanted to finish with is the amount of uh, the, the next generation of basketball players that this uh, performance has inspired. Uh, yeah. We're only going to get stronger and stronger as a country. So that's really exciting. Just think Steve Nash kind of exploded into this, exploded this generation of basketball players for us. Just think of what this group of group of guys is going to do for the next couple decades. It's pretty cool. Damn, damn that's such a good way to put it. I, my the hair and my arm standing up a little bit. Uh, never really, <laughs> it is true. It's true. Like, wow, that's such a good point, man. It's he made these guys live and dream. And now, man, 
I'm going to leave it on that. Well done, sir. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for being with us. Continued success. Enjoy. Uh, those girls are lucky to have you on the sideline, man. Keep oh, doing your thing you. and we'll be in touch. Yeah, thank you, Aaron. Thanks for everything. We are here with episode 36, the man himself um, from Winnipeg. He's joining us right now uh running errands for his wife but uh, has taken the time to sit here and uh just kind of go back in time and then also talk about the the present day and and what's happened with Canada basketball here in the last couple weeks which is super cool him and I have kind of text offline about it a little bit um big Todd who was a huge part of the national team for so many years um represented Canada um with great pride and uh obviously you know living in the state still but um know that his Hard is in Canada in many different ways. How are you, man? How's life for you? And um, how many games, or did you get to catch many games? Um, I know myself, I got up at 1.30 in the morning and actually um, took me probably two days to recover from that. <laughs> but uh, how you doing? And and what did you think about the FIBA World Cup? It was uh, incredible. I don't, I don't have the, uh, I don't have ESPN Plus. And so I was disappointed that I wasn't able to see the games in person, but I was following them and watching all the highlight recaps and watching, you know, watching the, the, uh, the ticker tape with great interest and just really thrilled for those guys. And just knowing how much it meant to me to qualify for the Olympics and to play in the Olympics and what, a what an important thing it was in my career. And I'm, I'm excited for these guys to get to experience that. And, for them to be on the podium on the world stage is something that I was never able to accomplish. So they've already accomplished so much and they have so much to look forward to. And I'm just glad they're going to, they're going to get to experience something They're They're, you know, I think that team is bonded forever now with what they've been through. And now they've got their, uh, their sights set on even bigger things next summer. Next time, let me know all I can send you my like sports net link or something, and you can log in and watch the games. Uh, I've never even thought of that whole thing that you wouldn't even have access because they they just streamed all the games on Sportsnet up here, right? So um, oh, I'm sure uh, I'm sure the priority was was USA, and then yeah, I didn't even think of that. Well, uh, next day, yeah, I appreciate that. Thank you for uh, I was I was just I mean I probably should have signed up for ESPN Plus, but I got a uh, got all the other streaming services. I don't know why I don't have that one, but uh, but it was I mean, sure you, uh, sure sure great to get the the results and. Things were looking a little shaky after that Brazil game, but they sure responded against against Spain and came up big against the number one ranked world basketball country, according to those rankings. Whatever those mean. Um, uh, yeah, we talked with Mr. Swords yesterday, and it's interesting. He touched on the same thing. He talked about the resiliency of the team being someone who, who you know, separate the NBA career and the Division One career, FIBA, which is such a different brand of basketball, which I think it was so good for Canadians um, to see it at that level um, that I hadn't seen it before and sort of the, the questionable calls and the crowds and all those things. Talk about your experience or, you know, going back in time, thinking about the resilient times that you used to have. And you talked about how that did bond you as a group as well, which I think is super important because one of the things that 2000 team they documented quite often was kind of you guys, you know, you made those policies about seeing friends and family in limited times and sort of really just locking in and, and trying to have the best experience possible. Um, but I just find it interesting. I've talked to two of you guys and you both talk about being resilient and what it takes for that FIBA um, kind of challenge that comes with it. Yeah, I think experience is really key because it's it's very different from playing high school basketball in Canada, very different from playing uh, D1 in a in a, I was going to say a major conference, the Pac-12, which is probably not going to be around for too much longer. <laughs> but then playing the NBA, those are all all different, but uh, you kind of know what you're going to experience. And then in international basketball, depending on what country you're in and what language the referees speak, you just don't know the tone. You don't know the physicality. You don't know what you're going to be allowed to get with, if to get away with if you're going to be... Uh, you know, get yourself in foul trouble or if they're just not going to, they're going to swallow their whistles. And so it can, the inconsistency from game to game is, can be a real challenge. And so I think you really have to just, just roll with the punches and that Canadian, this can, you know, this current Canadian team, they found a way to do that, to be able to fight through adversary, ad adversity, to be able to, to just 
just shake it off and keep going and being down 12 against Spain and to rally and, and with the U.S. in that bronze medal game, you know, hitting that big three to, to force overtime, that could have that could have been enough to shake other teams and think, you know what, we, we did our best, we had a shot, and now look what happened. But they just, you know, as soon as overtime started, they got right back to it. So no matter what happened, they they had a lot of resiliency. Um, and so I think the I think experience is really important, and and they're going to be able to use this going forward. So when you can get that experience and also have success at the same time, I think it bodes well for the future. So they know how tough it's going to be. They know not to underestimate anyone or anything, and they know mm -hmm. um, they've got to come out playing aggressive. But then if they if you start to get into foul trouble, then maybe you need to back off a little bit. And so I think they're a, the Canadian team is a very intelligent team. And I think they played smart. And I think they played unselfishly. And I think they were pretty malleable. And I think they just they were so talented um, offensively and defensively. And I think their ability to switch and to be able to guard anyone makes them makes it tough for teams to get uh, isolations on them, you know, makes it tough for for two man games to be able to get open shots because uh, whatever happens, Canada's right there. And so their their ability to help each other out, bail each other out and be there made them pr really tough defensively and it gave them chances to score and, and get hot. One thing, so, so many good points. One thing that really stuck out to me is, and I, and I know you've probably felt it, is you play some of the different countries, and especially in Europe, they, like they're just a very animated, right? Like it's every whistle or no whistle, someone's hands are in the air. I don't know if you saw Luca, he ended up getting tossed against us and he just... The whole first half it was every time he went to the hoop is like so over emotional. And I, I, I watched every game except the, the semi, uh, the second half of the semi and our guys were just so stoic. And I was almost like, is this an issue? But it seemed like it ended up being a strength of theirs because they were able to, like when we played Latvia, they had all their fans in the front. And I thought, oh, here we go. You know, we're going to let, but we just seemed like a very calm, mature bunch, even though age wise, I mean, Kelly is been with us for a long time and, and been a ride or die but a lot of these guys is kind of the first experience right so I I, I was really really impressed with what I saw and then knowing that and going to that bigger stage now you know with 12 teams the Olympics you know the U.S. is probably going to roll out different dudes um, you think about your time and your experience and how special that was for you and obviously you know there's some things like you know the France game or, you know and but whatever that happens right is there any advice or what would you say now, knowing someone 23 years now, 24, it's hard to believe it's been that long, but what would you tell some of these guys or, or uh, share with them about when it's their chance to get on the plane and go over? I think it would be just kind of follow the, follow your leaders. And, uh, and obviously Shea Gilgis Alexander has, you know, emerged in a lot of people's eyes as one of the top basketball players on the planet. And so to have about somebody, that guy, hey man, wow. Hey, I, I knew he was good. I didn't know he was yeah. that good. I mean, he's, he's great. Yeah. And so fortunately we had, we had Nash and we could, we could look to him uh, as a leader and someone to set the example. And then when you're, you know, when your leader is, you know, working the hardest in practice and and staying after and, and doing, you know, individual drills at, at game pace and really setting an example for what it takes to be successful. And then, you, you know, just not worrying about the other stuff. Maybe we're riding in a school bus instead of a Greyhound or maybe our hotel isn't <laughs> as nice as the dream team. You know, Steve's not complaining. He's sitting on the school bus, sitting on a bunch of bags, strumming a guitar. And he just, he worried about what mattered and what mattered was, was playing hard and sticking together. And, you know, let's not worry about what the refs are doing. Let's not worry about what the other, other team is doing. Let's, let's play through that. And so to have that modeled um, by him was something where we just had to try and uh, do our best just to kind of, to, um, you know, to get through those obstacles. And it seems like Canada has really good leadership and they have toughness and they, um, you know, they're, they, they play hard defensively. It gives them challenges. And I think they're. Uh, I think after going through this together and and having success, I think the future is is really bright. So I think they. Uh, I think they were really well, really well coached, and I think they they bought into the system. And I think they must have trained very hard leading up to this, and and they knew they had an opportunity they didn't want to let pass by. You don't want to, you don't want to leave it to one of these final tournaments and try and get one of these final spots. You want to take care of business, and now they can set their sights on on going into Paris and and trying to medal. I love it, man. Thank you for being with us today. It's awesome. It's so fun to just sort of, I, I really overlooked how many 
guys, I kind of knew in the back of my mind how many of the guys from the 2000, you know, even um, going to sit down with Johnny Lee today too, and sort of just how many guys we've had the pleasure of chatting with on the show. And I appreciate we, you and I have kind of kept a connection since then. And so I know that um, for you being down South and sort of seeing Canada do it probably brought a lot of pride to you. But the question is, are you coming to Paris with me or are you going to be in Wailea for the Olympics? What do you think? <laughs> uh, we'll have to, uh, we'll have to wait and see. So, uh, have you, uh, have you, have you bought your flight already? You booked your ticket? Still, you're all set? Uh, you know how, when you're, you know, I don't know what you're like, but my, my style around my wife is I kind of just make subtle drops, you know, like, well, so, you know, Canada qualified, it's in Paris next summer. You know, I start with that. Right. And then it's like, <laughs> you know, it'd be really good. I think, you know, me and my buddies were talking, maybe we just go for five days, try to catch a couple pool games. And it's like, I don't get the any response, but I know she's hearing it. So I'm sort of laying the groundwork right now, my friend, and then hopefully we'll be able to step into a, a more real conversation, if that makes sense. I don't know if my strategy is any good. I mean, she's still married to me, so I feel like I'm doing okay, but, uh, one day at a time here. <laughs> <laughs> You're throwing out some start throwing out some test grenades just seeing seeing how they land. Yeah, and at some right. point at some point it's like, okay, she's not responding because she's not vibing, or she's gonna be like, Are you trying to tell me something? Can we just talk about this? So, <laughs> you know, we're we're not the smartest mammals, but appreciate you, man. Thank you for being with us. Thank you again, you know, for everything that you have done and did for, for Canada basketball. And, and I know your 2000 group was a special group. And I hope that we can get to a point where as, at least on the men's side, the women's is already there where it isn't 23, 24 years, right? It's it's just something that happens every year and uh, those memories won't be so far. So thank you, man. Continued success. All the best to you and your family and good luck uh, staining uh, over the next few days. Hopefully the weather stays dry for you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Always nice to chat with you. Cheers, buddy. Take care. See ya. Next, ladies and gentlemen, we have none other than uh, probably the most unique perspective in terms of a gentleman who played for our program for a long time. Um, his episode, he talked about being mentored by a lot of Canadian coaches um, and also was a coach with our program. And now sitting back, I was thinking about our conversation today that we were going to have probably mentoring or working with who is our current head coach of the national team with his team, the Sacramento Kings, which is kind of amazing. Um, and then I look down and I see that this guy was episode 16 and we are currently on episode 116. So we're a hundred episodes later, which is wow. wild to think about and, and uh, pretty cool. We have none other than Mr. Jay Triano with us. How are you, sir? Doing very well. Very well. Thank you. Man. Awesome. Let, let's get right to it. The yeah. the buzzer goes and we see ourselves defeating Spain. Um, I'm sure you've had many moments on the span of your career uh, in terms of reflecting on your time with Canada because there's been so many things that have happened. What hits you there um, when you see that we finally make it through and, and qualify again? Well, it's interesting. I kind of had two really neat feelings. I, number one, I was just so happy for Jordy and the players that have been in the program for so long. You know, the Dwight Powells, the Kelly Olenek, the Melvin Edgem, the Scrub, uh, you know, Phil Scrub, uh, all the guys that, you know, that were in part of that program when I talked about, let's qualify, let's get you guys to the Olympics. Because for me, that's the greatest thing that happened for me as a coach was being able to take 12 players to the Olympic Games in, in the year 2000. Mm -hmm. um, and the second thing, though, it was like, man, this is the first time in five Olympics or five qualification processes that I'm not in the room. It's the first time mm -hmm. out of the five, you know, cause I was there in 80, 84, 88. And then of course in 2000, when we qualified and this is the first time that I wasn't there and it was like, Oh man, I'm just, and I remember being in that room on every occasion and just thinking, this is so cool. We're going to get to go to the Olympic games. And, uh, I just, I just felt for those players. It was, it was actually a very emotional time for me. I felt really, really happy that we are finally getting back. Yeah, no, I, I'm sure you did. Um, and then you see someone like Rowan, who's, you know, done a great job just asking the guys to commit. And, and then you seeing that buy-in, um, I was talking with Maeve and just sort of, did you see any parallels, you know, kind of like a, a young budding superstar and a Shea kind of coming out and blossoming? I mean, obviously he had an amazing NBA year this year. Steve yeah. kind of wasn't on that that level just yet, but that Olympic year just really elevated him. And then just a bunch of dudes that were willing to 
to buy in and do their jobs. You know, I, I thought there was yeah. some similar things happening. I don't know how you felt about that. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I agree. And, and you know, uh, Jordy, talk, I talked to Jordy pretty much every day. Mm-hmm. Um, about wow, what a job things. he did. Oh. Yeah, he was, he was, he was fantastic. And he's right. He's, he's unbelievable for it because he's such a, uh, he's, he's, he's into the team building. He's big on the team building and, uh, that's what it takes. It doesn't like, let's face it. The Americans have more talent than anybody, uh, mm-hmm. but if you don't play together and don't play the right way, and that's up to the head coach. And I thought Jordy just did a heck of a job getting them to play the right way. And, um, Every time that I talked to him, he just kept saying, these guys are amazing guys. They just like, they're great. There's not one guy that's out of line. He said, um, I just, he said, they're just really good kids and they, and they care about each other. And it was a very tight group. So that there made me think back to the year 2000, because that was our strength was how close these guys were, how much Mm -hmm. they accepted roles and how well they played together. Mm -hmm. And and then just, and (laughs) like, you really have to be that way too. I think hopefully the, the people that, took the opportunity to watch games and see like that feeble world cup is a grind, man, like changing locations, like just yeah. to be able to do it. You have to have a lot of trust in that locker room and a lot of belief um, or else things aren't going to go great. And I love the things, you know, the boxing gloves and, you know, everybody thought it was Dylan Brooks, just Brooks, just acting the fool, but that was actually one of their kind of team mantras from this, you know, the sports psych. And those are the little things. And I, and I agree. Mm-hmm. Um, but also cool. I think we're in a place now where like, you know, in 2000, social media wasn't as big. You guys didn't get right. probably, probably the coverage that you deserved. You went in and kind of shocked the tournament right away and, Aust- and beat Australia. But it's cool to see kind of Canada to be elevated um, because a lot of people, you know, you and I maybe don't have as much value in an Instagram clip, but a lot of younger people do. And I yeah. think to have our Canadians be part of that, how do we, how do we continue to elevate it though? I mean, I'm, sitting there screaming at the TV. I was like a little bit emotional too, just seeing the qualification. And I, how do we get the same energy we have for the Blue Jays and the Leafs that we, that we do for Canada basketball, you know? Well, hopefully this is a big step. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it was, uh, it was fairly high profile as far as our sport goes mm-hmm. and the national team goes, um, you know, I, it's going to be tough to change it. Uh, you know, Eli Pasquale and I used to walk around in, in Spain and we would say we were, we were more well known in other countries than we were in our own country <laughs> when we were playing yeah. for the national team. And, and it, to this day, um, you know, even Jordy and, he, you know, he talks about Spain. He goes, I remember you. I remember here's a guy who comes from Spain, comes over and he remembers me playing for Team Canada. Uh, yeah. And he's Spanish, right? He grew up in Spain. So um, I, hopefully this is the start. I, and I, and hopefully, like you said, uh, all of the Instagram stuff like that, people get on board. I, uh, maybe people were waiting for success. I sure hope so. But now we'll be front and center in the Olympics too, which is one of the most viewed things that we do in our country. We, we value the Olympics. And, uh, you know, the fact that we're going to be going, it's going to be free publicity leading up into it and all the, all the things that happen going in. So hopefully we have a real good run at these Olympics and it just it snowballs and it's just something that keeps going and going and going. Yeah. Um, now, upon your reflection, you mentioned so many times you've had the opportunity. If you could think, I mean, um, talked about buy-in, right, being together. If you had some advice for whatever group that gets to go, get on that plane and go over, what's a couple pieces of advice you would give based on your experience that you've seen? Well, it would probably be the same advice that I gave our guys uh, going into 2000. And that was my regret in 1984 of... Mm. Um, the um, getting caught up in the Olympic experience. And it wasn't so much that we did anything wrong, but it was like, well, we're in Los Angeles. And all of a sudden we qualify in Montevideo, Uruguay, and there's 15 of us. That's it. There's that, that's it. Mm -hmm. And then we go to the Olympic games and all of a sudden friends and relatives and everybody want to be part of it. And they jump on and they're, you know, without knowing it, they're zapping some of our energy, taking away from our togetherness, um, you know, we, we want to see other events. Well, half the guys are going here, half the guys are going there. And I, I told the players, I said, we were one spot away from a medal. We lost, we, we lost in the bronze medal game, um, to Yugoslavia. And I regretted that I didn't dedicate more to the two weeks that we were there. You're going to the greatest sporting event. You're not going there to be in a parade. You're not going in there to see boxing. You're not going in there to see track and field. Um, and our guys in, in Sydney were incredibly locked in. They were so, uh, they all went for meals together. They didn't let other athletes infiltrate their group. Um, and 
you know, I, I, to this day, I think that is one of the greatest things that I was able to share with them uh, through my experiences and something I didn't want them to have regrets about. Yeah, I love that. And I think it really paid off for that at times. So that's, that's great uh, reflection. Last question before we let you go tonight. And thank you mm -hmm. so much. Um, Talk a little bit about the Canadian coaching tree. I mean, we're talking in a, you grew up in a time when you were younger, Jay, it was, you know, um, Ken Shields and, you know, there were just a handful of guys that were kind of doing it and you see all these guys and it seems like the Canada basketball tree is just expanding player wise, but also coaching wise. And you're an ex no guy yeah. now. And it's so cool to see you got Nate Mitchell and all these other guys involved and just talk about the expansion. I mean, and, we had yourself and those years in between where we didn't win. And like, we had really good coaching in between that, yeah. right? Nick nurse, all that. But I just think we've got more kids playing. We've never had more kids playing in the game, but I think from an X's and O's standpoint, there's a lot of pride and we've seen more and more guys on NBA rosters too. Yeah. I think, um, you know, you're right. We have uh, Scott Morrison and Jama uh, Mahalea, uh, both, both assistant coaches, Nate Mitchell, um, uh, and myself, I still think that we have better coaches in Canada. We have great coaches. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, again, it goes back to the player. People don't recognize how good our coaches are. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Gordy Herbert's a Canadian who you know, I can, can't really say he was part of our tree, although he did spend some time coaching our national team, but he's from here. And he played basketball here and he wins the gold medal with the German team. We just don't celebrate coaches as much as I think we should. Um, and it, it's a shame. Uh, you know, I, I think that is the one thing in this country because um, we we do, like I said, we do have great coaches. We have great coaches at the university level. We have pro basketball in Canada now, and we have good coaches that are that are involved in that. Um, I just don't think we, that we celebrate them, and I don't think that we have enough in the NBA right now play, coaching at the highest level. I think there are quite a few Canadians that are more than capable to be in the NBA right now, and hopefully. You know, Scott and Nate and I, uh, you know, we do well and it, and, it, and it leads to like, you know, you you look to Canada for more players, look to Canada for more coaches as well, because I think we've got great coaches in our country. For sure. Couldn't agree more. Um, you excited about making your way up here in a few weeks and uh, I am. getting yes. ready for the exhibition game and m nice to come up to the coast when you can. I know you're probably you're here for the SFU golf tournament, but yeah. get, a, get another opportunity to come up here for a few days and looking forward yeah. to that. No, I'm really looking forward to it. Yeah, I I, I can't wait to get up there. Uh, uh, game sold out. I'm like, uh, it's that's crazy. And I'm like, I need, I need. They have no idea how many tickets I need. <laughs> and then, and then I get reminded that it's a Raptor home game. Right. And and and, and me and the Raptors don't really get along well. Better so bring your wallet, pal. You better bring think, your wallet. Yeah. yeah. I, I don't think they're giving me as many uh, comps as I'd like for the game. But uh, with all my family up there, uh, all three kids up there, I, I'm I'm looking forward to. You know, being back to the, in the basketball community in Vancouver and, mm -hmm. and also spending some time with some family. Awesome, man. Very well deserved. I mean, your your legacy will last forever with Canada basketball. And I'm sure, you know, you're, you, the, as life moves on, you continue to appreciate these moments even more. And I couldn't believe it, too. I was kind of half asleep. Me and uh, Dom Zimmerman were running our camp and I was like, damn, the tickets went on sale. And I was like, oh, damn, the tickets are sold out. I'm like, I'm going to have to tap into uh, some sources here. So. Yeah. Yeah. Crazy. Yeah. But that's great though. And it, it shows that what a great basketball community there is in Vancouver and how much of an impact the Grizzlies had. And uh, they want to see the Raptors play. And I think we're playing a pretty exciting brand of basketball right now too. Don't sleep on the Kings, man. I got some, I've got some ideas about how you guys are going to do this here. Anyways, thank you so much for your time. Um, as usual, your time and dedication towards Canada and all you've given to basketball here in our country. Um, there aren't enough words and continued success with you, your family and the Kings this year. And I hope you have a great time visiting everyone. And, uh, and it's just another positive experience and a good start to the season for you. All the best. I James. appreciate that. I appreciate that. Thanks a lot. And I love what you're doing, man. You're, you're doing what we've talked about. You're promoting the sport in our country, which is awesome. And I really appreciate you doing this. Trying my best, man. We got so many more stories to go, but, uh, we're going to keep doing as best we can. All right. Okay, brother. Take care. Thank Thanks. you so much. Right. Thanks a lot, man. In case you didn't know our second sponsor, ATO Basketball, aka ATO B-Ball, located directly at the Langley Event Center in British Columbia. This place has everything you need. I swear if you walk in and you're a hoop head, there's nothing you won't be able to find. Sale items, Jordan, Adidas, Puma, you name it. The brands are all there. Shoes, jerseys, retro, current. 
Vancouver Bandits. You can even get every basketball you name. Shout out to our boy Jeff at ATOB Ball for willing to be a sponsor to us. Go check them out. Check the store. Mention us. And who knows, you might find yourself lucky. Thanks to ATOB Ball. Our next guest today is, uh, as I'm looking at the list and the roster of people we're going to be talking to, episode 11, if you can believe that. How long ago does that feel? Um, I don't know if that's good or bad or in between. We have my guy, the sharpshooter, Mr. Andrew Mavis with us today. How are you, sir? I'm good, Mitch. How's it going, buddy? No complaints, my man. Um, Like we were just saying, though, but nobody would want to hear them anyways, so... What's (laughs) What's <laughs> exactly. what's going on? Obviously, you and I are on a on a couple group chats, and we and we chat a lot, and sort of we're analyzing the tournament, um, watching Canada. I mean, when we could, when the hour was decent enough. But um, as you saw them qualify and defeat Spain, um, what were the thoughts and feelings that you were going through, kind of seeing that, and uh, you know, reflecting back on <clears throat> twenty three years ago? Yeah. Um, yeah, it was obviously, it was obviously amazing to see. Um, it's about damn time. Uh, we've been waiting for, (laughs) we've been waiting for this for a while. And, um, yeah, it was just, it was just special to see a group of guys come together and seem like they were playing for each other and playing for Canada. And, you know, it was, it was, uh, it was special, special to see for sure. Um, they don't like to like, compare right because it's two two different teams but it seemed like in similar ways you know we saw uh a superstar in shea kind of really step in i mean he had a great year obviously was first team all nba steve wasn't at that level yet but kind of just like that global stage i mean you know steve did it at the olympics and hopefully we'll see this happen at the olympics with shea and then you know guys like kelly and just guys that really just bought into their roles so it's very similar in terms of that i mean i guess that is also a very fiba thing right i think the whole idea of making superstar teams in in fiba doesn't necessarily uh translate right like it does in the nba so did you think of or see any similarities or were you just sitting back enjoying uh coffee in the mornings and, and watching yeah. the guys ball out? Yeah. I mean, I definitely saw some similarities. Um, I think it, yeah, like you, like you were saying, I think guys did buy into their roles and were happy. I mean, w- whether they were happy or not, they were okay with not being the number one option. Mm-hmm. Like RJ seemed to be okay getting subbed out at certain times, realizing that he wasn't, didn't have it going and you know SGA was the was the man and um all, yeah I, I would say that it was it was it was similar to you know when when we were playing way back 23 years ago where you know guys knew their role roles and and fit in fit in well with each other and just did the, did their best with what they what was in front of them so yeah but I was def- definitely fun to watch I think you also, like you, you had a sentiment. Like many other people, I think you you lived it. But I think many Canadian fans were kind of like, ah, oh, finally, you know. But I think also watching that tournament um, and the grind, you know, changing locations and the amount of time. Like, I think it's a good reminder too that although there were some upsetting times in between the 2000 success and now to just realize how friggin' hard it actually is to qualify for an Olympics. I mean, it's 12, only 12 teams going to this tournament, right? Like it is not an easy task mentally or physically. Oh, 100%. And that, yeah, you saw it in this tournament. It seemed like they were flying high and, uh, <laughs> and then all, and then all of a sudden it's like, okay, well, you know, we have to beat Spain or, you know, mm-hmm. losing you're out and it, like going leading up to, you know, their, their loss. Um, yeah, it seemed like they were. There was no way they were going to lose a game, and then all of a sudden, it's like, oh, all of, yeah, you got to win to get in. And uh, yeah, it's it's extremely, extremely competitive and extremely difficult, as we saw. Um, and yeah, they they got it done. When they did, a couple more questions before we let you go. When they did, yeah, like, no did they? Uh, would, were you chatting with any of the guys from those teams? Or is it kind of you know, is that everybody doing their own thing or? Were there any moments where it was like reaching out, going like, wow, look at this game or anything like that? 
I mean, it was too early in the morning to do that. <laughs> <laughs> Just but, but yeah, but Garachi and I, we still chat often, and um, mm-hmm. we were messaging throughout the day, and then yeah, we had a few few conversations during in the middle of the tournament, and um, yeah. We were just, we were just so impressed because I mean, at the time when we played, um, you know, made qualified for the Olympics and then played in the Olympics, it, it kind of had the feeling that this was just going to be the new norm for Canada mm-hmm. moving forward, right? With with players playing in the NBA, more players, you know, getting recognized on the world stage, and then it kind of it didn't happen again. So. <laughs> and it didn't happen for a long time, as we all know. So yeah. it was. It makes it that much more special now, and hopefully, um, we're here to stay. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, as you think about your experience um, with the national team, the ins and outs, the in betweens, the fun, the the downs, the ups, and then qualifying for the Olympics. Um, if there is one or two things, pieces of advice you could give the training staff, the coaches, anybody from your own personal experience, uh, what would it be? Um, I mean, I think just getting everyone to buy in from, uh, you know, from the trainer to the, every assistant coach, everyone to be on the same page. And it's easy. I mean, easy to say, but it's harder mm-hmm. to, to do it and put, put your egos, ego aside and, and literally focus on, you know, the group, as a whole and just try to, to, to be a complete team. And that's what, um, yeah, that's what Triano got us to buy into when we back then. And it sounds cliched and cheesy and all the stuff you say, but we truly were uh, a complete team who were playing for each other, loved each other and, you know, accepted the roles we, we were given at any moment and just kind of rolled with the punches. And we felt that from, like I said, like Johnny Lee, Everyone, everyone was just a complete kind of like a family, and that mm-hmm. that's kind of what you have to in those tournaments. How difficult they are, um, you know, you have to you have to be like that, or else I don't think you're going to be successful. Yeah, I agree, and I think um, you know there's going to be obviously some questions and see who the additions are, and some tough decisions to be made in terms of letting a couple guys go if other, you know, if Jamal yeah. or other guys decide to play. But I think you yeah. make a good point. And it seemed like it was a good vibe with the guys. Um, I really liked Lou Dort's interview after they lost to Brazil there and just sort of like saying, hey, believe in us, trust in us, don't panic. We believe in ourselves. And and it seems like they're all there to uh, exactly. represent Canada and do it wholeheartedly, which is which is amazing. <laughs> and I don't think you can get to a bronze medal like they did without that belief, you know? Exactly. Yeah. Belief yeah. and belief in each other and playing for each other. And, um, it seemed, uh, you know, like Jody Fernandez did a great job with them as well in that, wow, in that terms. Right? Yeah, yeah, for sure. It's outstanding. Well, buddy, oh, man. Th- thank you, man. I really appreciate your time. I mean, it's, uh, I was sitting there watching that game down in Birch Bay and when they beat Spain and I was just thinking, wow, it's been a long time. Cause I was in Brandon, Manitoba, watching you guys beat <laughs> Australia in the open round of the 2000, right? It's, it's, it's a long time and it's long overdue and it feels good to uh, just sort of have a little bit of Canadian basketball ego, so to speak. You know what I mean? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And it's going to be so fun to watch, uh, watch them in the Olympics next year. It'd be amazing. No doubt. Okay, buddy, all the best to you. We'll be in touch soon. And, uh, and uh, you know, thank you for all the years of dedication to the national team and, and committing your time and energy and uh, creating a legacy for someone to uh, shoot for. No worries, buddy. Thanks so much, Mitch. Cheers, man. All the best. See you, bud. Bye-bye. Ladies and gentlemen, our next guest here is, uh, some would say, more important than a coach or a player. Everyone needs a good manager, trainer, someone to uh, take care of the squad, organize things and do everything behind the scenes. Uh, he is episode 21. If you can believe that not long ago, we are all the way up to 115 now, but uh, we have another other than Mr. Johnny Lee with us. How are you, sir? Very good. Thanks. Thanks for having me on. Uh, episode 21. That was during the bubble in Orlando. It sure was, my friend. It Jeez. sure was. How long ago does that feel? Wow. It's like almost a lifetime. And then we went to Tampa <laughs> and it's like two years that you kind of forgot or kind of lost and just lost track of time there. Yeah, for sure. Are you, are you making your way out here uh, in a few weeks with the uh, squad? 
Yes, October yeah. October second. Yeah, training awesome. camp in Vancouver again. The, back to the six oh four. You got it, man. You got it. Now, did you get much time to catch uh, the national team games, or were you just following on the ticker, or um, a little bit of both? I mean, obviously you're in that world, so it's around you. But uh, what was your perspective? Yeah, so I was I was supposed to go with the national team this year. But unfortunately, I had uh, I had to get the uh, hip surgery uh, the week before training camp started. Damn, how's uh, that? So How just, are you doing? Yeah, oh no, I'm, uh, hips fine. Just had to yeah. get it cleaned up a bit. Just uh, yeah, other yeah. times catching up to me. So <laughs> I, I got it on the 26th, and then I think camp started on like the the second of August. So as soon as I was able to, I I went over and uh, hung out uh, uh, at the at the camp. Nice. So, nice. Yeah. So I can I can stay away. I just wanted to say hi to the guys. Say you know, say hi to Jordy. Say hi to Coach Blatt and all the people that I've you know worked with in the past as well. Sure. Because uh, yeah. you know I, I worked with the national team the last two years already. So this yep. this was the first year I couldn't uh, I couldn't join them. So with that you know sort of unique perspective, <clears throat> did, did you? And obviously you got to play the games and you got to go through it. And knowing you know, I think the biggest thing is for the fair weather sort of fans that followed the team, just seeing what a grind the world cup is, right? Like it's a crazy tournament. What was the sense that you were getting from the the team overall from your days, just sort of sitting there? Um, or did you get anything? Was it, was it sort of like an unknown or was there a quiet confidence? No, I think there was, you know, the, the confidence started to build once the guys uh, started to play uh, their exhibition games, mm-hmm. you know, exhibition games in, uh, it was in Germany first, I believe, and then they went over to Spain. Yep. And I think uh, they, they, those games are so important to, to to see where you're at, to see what you need to do, see how you need to develop, uh, and also at the same time, you got to be able to see uh, what everybody brings to the table. You know, mm-hmm. especially the guys that don't get heavy minutes, you're gonna have to rely on them sometime. And 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 we saw that on the. The one game where Trey Bell Hines just went off and had five in a row, just like yeah. uh, Dylan Brooks, you know, and you know having those those type of role players that that might not necessarily be NBA players and not get many minutes, they're just as important. I mean, those guys are the kind of like the, the 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 blood and guts of 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 that team. I mean, they're sure. the ones that showed up for every uh, window, for example, right? You know, Dom and I were just talking about Phil Scrub like just two minutes ago, right? Just talking about him and like he's on the floor in the bronze medal game. Like, you know, it's right. just to have that yeah. longevity. Yeah, you need those glue guys, right? Absolutely. Um, so what were your thoughts and feelings when you saw or found out like they have that tough game against Brazil? I'm sure the panic button hit for a lot of people that are not really sure what's going to happen. You know, it's like we've seen this before. And then they, they're able to just, you know, play a solid game. They're down to Spain but they seemed like such a composed group and were able to pull that game out when that final horn went. What were your emotions? I know I, I said at the start of this episode, like um, I've got a little teary eyed, like it was emotional. You know I mean? If you've been invested yeah. in Canada, like how did you feel and what, what were your thoughts? What came back to you? You know, for, for me, it was, it was almost like uh, almost deja vu of being in Puerto Rico mm. and, and, and realizing that we, we just qualified for the Olympics and, and I don't know, like you said, you got teary eyed. There's a lot of dust in my house too. And my eyes yeah, got yeah. a little watery, so I gotta <laughs> I gotta make sure I dust before I watch these games. But uh, yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah, no, it was just a huge, uh, almost like a huge uh, weight lifted off your shoulders to finally, finally make it to uh, you know the Olympics after what 23 years. That's that's a long time. You, you don't realize how long it is, but. At the same time, the Olympics is the hardest tournament to get into. You know, yeah. they only take what twelve teams. Twelve. That's exactly what Sorgi said too. Yeah, it's the hardest te- hardest tournament to qualify for, and and you know, like teams like Spain, they're going to have to battle it out, even though they've been favorites for so many years. Mm-hmm. You know, they have one wrong game, and and they could be uh, and on the outside looking in pretty quickly, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, but, for sure. Know, kudos to uh, kudos to Germany and Gordy Herbert. You know, unreal uh, Canadian Canadian uh, coach for many years, and uh, you know, working with him in the past uh, with the national team. You know, w- winning a world champion and then Canada getting a medal. 
I mean, that's that's pretty good for ca- Canadian basketball overall. Yeah, I mean, when you when you talk about it, it, does feel like it's been so long. I mean, you and I, because we're in the middle of it, we'll tell ourselves twenty three years hasn't been that long, but it has. But to see the growth of the program, the players, like you said, the coaches, um, and just I mean, the coaches that we did have along those those twenty three years were phenomenal. We had top level coaching, right? And so as you think and reflect a little bit and and super cool that you're still involved knowing the guys having relationships with them if one of them to, was to ask you you know they get their they get prepped next summer and they're getting ready before they hop on that plane or wherever they're training and go into France what would be some advice you would give to them what's what's a few things that you learned um about the olympic experience that you would pass on you know it's 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 about the it's about the team it's never about one person anymore you know, the the guy that epitomized that and I learned from over the years, you know, are are uh Steve Nash. You know, he was about team and, and it wasn't about him. Uh and I think those are so that's so so important, especially in the sh- in a quick tournament like the Olympics. Every mm-hmm. game counts. And and you know, to have an off day could could mean that you're you're out of it quick. So, uh, you know, I just remember like, uh, you know, in, in 2000, our very first game against Australia, the host country and everybody's, everybody's counting us out already. And then we just upset that whole country completely. And, you know, you never know when things are going to just change and, and you got to believe in yourself. And, and it's not always the, the team with the, the best talent. It's the, the team that has the, that can play together. Uh, it's the most important part. It's such from, a good, such a good 12. point. Yeah. And, and, 12, you, and you look at that 25. 2000 group, right? Like that's kind of what they were known for and no disrespect to anywhere in between. I mean, but you talk to a guy like swords, he'll say flat out, I was a role guy. I was a defender, you know, but, but just was part of it and wanted to be a part of it and was willing to do whatever he could. And so you just really got that sense. And one thing I took away from the group that just qualified is just, how stoic they were, right? I, I just like there were so many moments I thought, all right, here comes the panic button. And then you got all these guys that just, you know, you see these other European com- countries, they're going friggin' nuts and they're every foul call or no call. And our guys just seem to be. And I think that started with Jordy all the way down, you know, Nate Mitchell, like these guys did a phenomenal job, but they just had a way about them that I think in a big tournament like the Olympics will go far as well. And what your thoughts are on that? No, absolutely. Especially the way, uh, Jordy carried himself throughout the whole the whole uh, tournament. He never panicked. Never mm-hmm. looked. You he know, really didn't. Hey, it was crazy. He did yeah. not panic at all. And he it's uh, and kudos to him for having that type of international experience in the past. Yeah, you know, with uh, you know, with I think I believe with Spain and so on, and uh, you know, being able to beat Spain in that to for the qualifier and upsetting you know the 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 his mentor, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I love, I love, uh, 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 what's his name? Scoriola. Oh uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, I know what you're talking about. Yeah. He, you know, he, he he's my a, he guy. A, we won a championship together. Oh yeah. That's right. Yeah. yeah. I think he had a funny tweet too. He's like something to Gordy Herbert. It was like, he was him holding the trophy. He was like, all right, this is yours, but I'm getting it back soon or something like that. Right. But yeah. <laughs> Super cool. Um, Sergio, you know, this, Sergio. That's right. Sergio. Hey, hey, th- thank you so much for your time. I'm hoping to make the game when you guys make it out here. Um, and I had no idea you were still that highly involved. I mean, other than the hip injury, uh, I think it's so cool um, because it was super apparent when you and I had the opportunity, Johnny, to talk. Uh, not, I mean, you've, you've built a great career out of being a great human being and working really hard and knowing your craft and being good at what you do. But I think listening to your words when you were describing in our our episode when we had the chance, what that 2000 year meant to you and to hear you still wanting to and giving up that time to be involved. I think it says a lot. So props to you, man. That's fantastic. That that was a nice way to start because I had no idea that you were still that attached. Yeah, no, there was a, you know, uh, uh, it was, it was such a great joy to see them qualify because we missed it in uh, Victoria when we lost to Mm -hmm. Croatia. And then uh, last year was just uh, kind of like a qualifying year and, and playing games and, and different venues and stuff. But this was the year that that was really, really important. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm just glad I was I was able to to see the guys off before they, they left. And uh, 
uh, you know, hopefully, you know, something, something happens. So. Yeah. And it'll be cool for you when you, as the season starts, you know, you're on the road or they come to your place and you finally get to see them and give them a big hug. It'll be a good moment. Right. Cause it's, there's a, there's a connection now between those two groups and you're a part of that and you're part of both, which I think is absolutely fantastic. No, for sure. And then, you know, and, and, and for, for me as well, the uh, MVP of the tournament, he's going to be on our team. And right. That's even better. Right. So lots we were just of joking. We were there. like, we were wondering if you were, uh, you know, giving him a quick massage or something. That's why you're running a little bit late for our chat, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> so cool. Uh, appreciate you, man. I hope I get a chance to bump into you when you guys are in town. If not continued success, keep being who you are, keep, uh, you know, pushing the boundaries and, and keeping these guys healthy. And thanks for being such a good soul, man. No, I appreciate it. Hey, uh, congratulations on your uh, podcast. I mean, this is this, that's great. You're, you're doing great things with basketball and, and it's great to hear somebody from, uh, from the 604 doing great things with it. Appreciate it, man. It's been a super fun adventure and like, honestly, so much more to come. You know, there's so many good stories out there. And so we'll get as many as we can. Thank you so much. Awesome. We'll talk soon. All right, buddy. You bet. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye-bye. Muscling through the uh, FIBA World Qualifying, uh, watching Canada get back to uh, glory on the men's stage. Uh, we thought here at the podcast would be a fun idea to um, just sort of reconnect with our former guests who were on the last team to qualify for the Olympics. Um, and we have our first guest, which is uh, episode 46, Mr. Sean Swords. How you doing, man? Great, great. Thanks. Uh, thanks for reaching out again. No worries. You've been through a lot in the last 12 months, making some interesting family choices in terms of leaving your job coaching and moving down to the States. Yeah. You know, just sort of a kind of a chaotic time for you. How's it been and how you doing? You're looking well. Yeah, it's been, it's been great. Yeah. We moved, uh, we moved to Long Island and, uh, I'm coaching, uh, the, uh, with the Long Island, uh, Nets, the, uh, G league team of the Brooklyn Nets. So, yeah, uprooted from Sudbury to to uh, Glen Cove, actually New York. Which, I mean, it's it's kind of not that different from Sudbury. More, uh, it's not really Manhattan or anything. So it's uh, it's yeah, been yeah. amazing. <laughs> good, good. Well, let's get right into it, man. I don't know how much time you had, or if you crawled mm-hmm. out of bed like me. Um, I got up at one thirty for a couple of the games, and yeah, yeah, and then things like that, and just sort of. How does it feel to be watching Canada make it back to the stage? Um, and and what things did it bring back for you? Like, did it bring back any memories and stir anything up from that special time in your life? Yeah, I mean, it, it definitely did. It's for on one sense, it. Uh, I mean, them getting to the medal round made me feel a little bit more like uh, our FISU Games teams, which had uh, a lot of the uh, Olympic team members on it as well, where we're in a medal round and that kind of energy. Um, but uh, but just seeing them actually be favored in most games was was awesome to, to actually yeah. watch as well. So that was <laughs> that was great. But it was uh, it was so much fun. Yeah, I was getting up to watch them and you know setting the alarm to get up uh, get up at four to four thirty to watch it and and really really loved it. Um, yeah, we won't talk about the Brazil game where I think that was their biggest favorite. But anyways, hey hey, that it happens, right? And I and yeah. you know I think a lot of people kind of. I know myself try to stay positive, you know, when you've, as a fan and supporter, you've been watching it so many times and you're like, you know, and I'm a, I'm a Chicago Cubs fan too. So I'm like, oh boy, right. It's hard not to go to that dark place where you're like, here we go again. But I think it says a lot about their resiliency and the ability to put that one behind them and how they bounce back. Um, what was special um, from your perspective, like what were the takeaways and what do you think it says for Canada? I mean, obviously um, you've got, daughters that are hooping now. And, and I think the women's program is in a really good place and we've taken a long time for us to get sort of knock that wall down. Now that we have, you know, what, what do you think their perspective is going forward from your playing and coaching days? Like give us some insight into your brain there. Yeah. Well, I, I think, you know, over, obviously people are frustrated over the years that we haven't got back to the Olympics, but I think people slowly start to realize that it's not really that easy to get to the Olympics. You know, it's, <laughs> yeah. it, it's tough. Um, so I always, you know, I've, I've coached the national team for a bunch of years too. Uh, the junior yeah. teams, the national teams, the senior team, been at camps, um, FISU games as well. But 
you know, the, the players always are, have always bought in and, and tried to do the best they could. Mm -hmm. um, contract things get in the way at times, but we always had teams that could, you know, do really well and qualify. And it's just, it is really tough. So I think this should actually give us even more confidence that uh, not only that we can qualify, that we can medal because mm -hmm, we've proven mm -hmm. it now. You know, it's something the players have seen. seen. And so I think that's an important aspect of it that just have that, that confidence that you, that you could do it. Um, I, I think the coaching, you know, we've had so many different coaches, you know, just obviously starting with Jay and then Jay was gone for a bit. Leo took over and then Jay came back. And then we went, uh, you know, through Gordy Herbert, who just won the gold medal. It's <laughs> crazy, uh, yeah. You know, we had a lot of different coaches, Nick Nurse, and then into Jordy. So I think the coaches, we've had unbelievable coaching throughout mm -hmm. all those years. And 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 so the, we have the players, we have the coaches. You know, I, I would honestly just like to see the the country really get behind us all the time. You know, there you, you see it in pro sports a lot where we have the fair weather friends and, you know, people jump around the bandwagon and stuff. And I, it's our country. Like you just, you just buy in and, and you love it no matter what. And I think I'd like to see more people get on that, on that track. I agree. We do, uh, at the end of every month on a Thursday, we try to sneak up the dads, put kids to bed and go up for, to the pub for a beer and we chatting and they're all kind of sports guys. Right. And I, I literally said that a few weeks ago, I said, drives mm -hmm. me nuts. How just, the when it comes to the, just basketball, there's just a lack of energy and support and the mm -hmm. kind of the ride or die. And like, it's okay that people, go to the dark place when we're down, but at least they're on board, right? They're there. Like they're, they're, they're rolling with it. And I agree. And I think now that we have these guys and, and that are, you know, got, you got a guy like Shea, who's just, I mean, he's a first team all, all NBA. Right. And so hopefully just that fair weather fan might actually get a little more invested and come next summer. It might be even that more impactful. And then that momentum carries through. I think you make a really good, good point there. Um, too early to tell. But you got a prediction for uh, for Paris or what? Well, I like I, I I like what Jordy did in a short period of time. I think he has that FIBA mind that that kind of helped the players a lot. And to mm -hmm. be honest, I loved what the players did. Like you mentioned a little bit earlier, the resilience. I think I think they showed resiliency almost through every game. And and how many slow coach, starts did they have? Like every game, yeah. it was like oh my god. And then all of a sudden, we just click mm -hmm. in. I'm like, wow, these guys are. Mm -hmm. And but they, I think they're very unemotional, so it kind of came across as like, are they in it? And then you're like, whoa, they right. are like they're ready to go. Yeah, sorry to cut yeah, you off. Like it, yeah, no, no. So it took it took them some time every game to get get to used to the style of play against the team they're playing against, and then what's going to be effective. And and I think that that although as a coach and, and sometimes as a player, that's bothersome to you that you you're not getting on the right foot right away. And mm -hmm. but the fact that you could rely on that later in the tournament uh, was huge. Like yeah. the resiliency factor, like you, you, you go through some, like you said, as a fan, you go through some dark stages as a coach and as a player <laughs> during those tournaments where you've yeah. done so well and you lose. I mean, we went through it a bunch of times in the years that we, the year that we did qualify. And then the year that we didn't qualify, those tournaments were, were roller coaster where you're just like, okay, hey, are we going to win? Or are we going to lose? And okay, let's just go play. And you're trying to put those thoughts out of your head, but it mm -hmm. still pops up and, you know, as you're going through things, it's just natural as human instinct to really see what's in front of you and who you've played. So the fact that they were able to do that, I could see the kind of building and, yeah. you know, and that's a, that's a tribute to the staff and, and to everybody involved that they didn't really get too excited and too down. Like even the Brazil loss, yeah, it's disappointing, but yeah. I kind of thought like, you know, we've waited this long. It's like, of course, we're going to wait one more game. Like, what, 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 you know? yeah, yeah. like I, it didn't. It, it was. It kind of was. It was poetic for me to be like, all right, we lost to Brazil. Of course, we're going to lose to them, and now we're just going to beat Spain. And I, I said it to you know to friends. I said it to members of the coaching staff. I was like, it's no big deal. We got Spain now. Big deal. Yeah. We're we're going to we're going to win this. And then getting to the corners, I mentioned it to people as well. It's like they're going to medal now. It's it's that was that was the mentally the hardest part was qualifying, and now it's now let's move on and we're going to medal. And, and sure enough, they did. And it, it, yeah. the, the players resiliency. And then that, you know, coming from the players themselves, you know, from the NBA guys, from, from Kelly, from all those guys, and then the staff just being able to not, you know, get too excited or too down when they did lose, you know, that game out. It, it's, it's unbelievable. So it's uh, yeah. you know, predictions, you know, I, I, I hate to predict, predict one European team specifically, but mm -hmm. you know, I, I, I see Canada meddling again. You know, what What medal is that? Who knows? Um, U.S. is going to medal. And then, you know, I, I would hesitate to say which European team would, uh, sure. would be up with meddling as well. Because, you, you know, the Olympics is only 12 teams that make it. Yeah. So, you know, it, it's it's uh, once you get there, it's kind of 
it's technically supposed to be easier to medal than the World Cup, but it, <laughs> it, it is tough. Yeah, I, I think I, before we let you go, I thought Lou Dort's words after the Brazil game, I don't know if you saw his interview uh, with Arash, mm-hmm. and he just basically said, what, what, what do you have to say to the fans that are kind of freaking out? And he just said, mm-hmm. just trust us. We're ready. We'll mm-hmm. be ready. And I thought it was so great. And he was so serious and they responded so well. Uh, before we let you go, man, I appreciate it. It's good to see mm. your face again. And, and I'm glad you and the family are well. If there's one piece of advice for that roster, the coaching staff, the managers, when it gets time to hop on the plane and go or to step in into the arena or whatever it is, what's what's some advice that you would give to those people to get the opportunity to compete in the Olympics? Well, it's it's a special moment. Obviously, I mean, I, I we, talking about it the, the last time we spoke. Like, I still get chills thinking about walking through the stadium. Um, mm-hmm. And then, you know, if I watch back to some of the games, like, though it was special. So I think, you know, just really buying into the process and really diving into the process of the Olympics and enjoying it, it's going to mm-hmm. help you really succeed. You know, mm-hmm. and you know, it, it pains me to to that we lost to France in that game because I like I watched it and I. We could have done so much more. We could, have, could we do one more thing? But that that hurt a lot. But the whole process of it was just unbelievable. And just going through it, enjoying it with the teammates, with your coaching staff, like just enjoying it, it's going to help you, you know, be a better team and actually get further than you you think you can um, yeah. throughout that whole process. But it's just, you know, that's what I would just say. Just go, go there and ready to enjoy it. And this that's the way I, I believe this coaching staff and, and the players do play. They enjoy each other. I was at one of the one of the uh, practices at training camp, and you know, it was there was a good aura around the group. And I just making sure that that stays, you know, paramount in their minds. That you know, I think our one thing our 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 team did very well too is we kind of get let distractions not bother us at, at mm-hmm. the Olympics. Now it wasn't social media area, so it's era. It's yeah. going to be a little different, but yeah. we really tried to not do anything other than focus on basketball or like, you know what? Jay was great. He's like, there's going to be all kinds of Olympics in your time and you might never go to another one again. So let's make sure that we, we don't go look at other events until we're done our events or, you know, we're not going to hang out with friends a ton um, outside of game days and, and off days. Like let's stay together as a group and do everything together. And I think that, that, that hit home big time. Like it was, it was a valid point. Like you can go and watch, but are you ever going to participate again? <laughs> let's make sure we make the most of it. For sure. Right on. Appreciate you, man. Um, how badly are you getting beat in shoot arounds with the kids these days? Ooh, shoot arounds. Yeah. I, I think, I think even in my heyday, they would beat me in my shoot arounds the way they shoot the ball. <laughs> so I'm not, it doesn't disappoint me when they beat me in a shooting competition now. <laughs> it's getting, they go by you though. That's the, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. The feet, they're, they're playing you, a lot more FIBA obviously. So, yeah, you know, I, yeah, I'm yeah. a little more physical in the FIBA ball, so I just hit them a bit. <laughs> tell them the refs aren't going to call that. <laughs> <laughs> Love it, man! So good to see you. Appreciate you. Thanks for you know being so invested in Canada, and uh, I know everybody's excited. This will be a great episode. So all the best, continued success, and we'll keep in touch. All right, okay, thanks. Cheers, man. Take care. If you're a basketball player out there in the Lower Mainland or uh, BC in general, and you're looking for somewhere to play, we have a proud sponsor, and that is PGC Hoops. You can find them at pgchoops.ca. And the thing that makes them unique and that we're proud to sponsor them and them be a sponsor of us is it's a true nonprofit basketball organization found in the east side of Vancouver. The mission is cost-effective elite basketball for all. Find the website, take a look, register your kids, register yourself, look for the programs. And if you have any questions, reach out to me and we can contact you with the right people. This is a good program for the right reasons. We appreciate you, PGC Basketball. Ladies and gentlemen, we have our first guest on this episode who's uh, a gentleman who we haven't had the opportunity to sit down with, although I've been harassing him for well over a year and a half. We will make it happen. Um, In my personal opinion and many others, one of, if not the most dominant uh, U-Sport CIS player we've ever seen. 
Um, some would call a gentle giant, but you wouldn't want to get in his way in the low block. We have none other than Mr. Eric Heinrichsen with us today. How are you, sir? I'm good, thanks. Thanks for having me on the show. No worries, and I'm buddy. just waiting for that apology. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, talk, we'll talk about that when we get our episode done i know and you know it's what the people want and don't worry oh man do you want me to just say it no 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 okay no. fine i want you All to right. mean it though when you do say it <laughs> <laughs> okay man how you doing how's life i'm good man life's good can't complain you know good. we got through the, the covid years and now things seem to be getting a little back to, back to normal yep yeah, so yeah it's good Good. Um, excited for upcoming hoop season. We got, got your son's team coming over to our tournament, which will be fantastic. Um, so you're sitting there kind of coaching when you can and watching your son play the game. And he got invited to some Canada stuff this year, obviously knowing that you were involved with the national team for many years. Um, and we were on a group text with with Robbie Wright for a lot of the FIBA World Cup. Um, what were your feelings and emotions when you, you know, and one thing that you you kept saying, boys, they're going to do it. They're going to do it, boys. Like, even after that tough Brazil game, you're like, you know what, boys, I think they're going to bounce back. All we got to do is beat Spain. So when they did finally beat Spain and then end up getting a medal, what was stirring around in your mind, uh, knowing that you were part of that 2000 team that made it to the Olympics? I think... Um... The biggest thing was just proud as, as probably everybody that listens to this podcast or Canadian basketball players, you know, for them to achieve their goals, it was just a sense of proudness, right? Um, you know, I was watched, watched, I was actually working when I watched the game and, you know, just kind of, I was just fired up, excited. And, uh, it's, it's a testament to them. They, you know what, they had some challenging years. Um, they had some challenging times during this tournament, but you know, they pulled through and they won the games, the game that they had to win. And they came back and, and in true Canadian fashion, showed some grit and determination and pulled through. And, um, yeah, it was something special. Do you remember when that final horn went in Puerto Rico and you guys had qualified and, and what the locker room was like after that moment? Well, it's funny you say that because I wasn't there on really? that team. No, no, that was, uh, I was not on that team. So thanks for bringing that up. But um, <laughs> no, uh, no, Do actually. Do your homework, uh, podcast host. Do yeah, your homework. Exactly. Like, look at a no, roster, no. man. Give it a Google. Yeah, that was, um, I would just say there was the everybody and then Ricky Anderson was probably down there. Right. Yeah. So, um, but same sort of thing, you know, I would imagine. Um that pure jubilation, excitement, you know, they've you've done all this work in the lead up and then to actually accomplish your goal and qualify for the Olympics. I mean, that's what you've been playing for all summer. And I mean, something special. So no, knowing that the, that happened and you were the one who was chosen to go in 2000, right? You've got guys like Tommy Scrub who have been with the program. They've come calling every time. Um, no matter what tournament and, you know, they're kind of like the last couple cuts. Um, what are those emotions and knowing that there could be some roster changes come Olympic time too, right? You know, we, we may see the emergence of Jamal, who knows, I've read a few articles with Rowan just saying how, you know, yeah, like Wiggins hasn't responded and doesn't want to, but also Dylan Brooks was pretty darn good in the tournament, right? So it's a pretty interesting thing that a lot of guys have to go through the grind of actually qualifying and then knowing that things could be turned around once the tournament's on. When the tournament does happen, though, what's some advice you would give the Team Canada boys that are out there um, based on your experience when you were there? You know, I think, I think you know, we talked about it earlier, was um, everybody's got a role uh, where, however small it is, I know when when we were there, you know, I I wasn't getting a lot of playing time, or whatever. But I knew that come practice time, I would go as hard as I can in in the drills. And you know, if I'm guarding, you know, at the time for either Pete or Big Todd or whoever I was guarding, it was it was I was competing, right, mm -hmm. and pushing them so that you know when it comes to game time, they're ready to go and and they know they're they have to play against something hard, right? Mm -hmm. other than it being the olympics to take the name out what was the difference about that tournament like what was it is it because it was 12 teams only you know is it all the best guys are arriving and playing you know like what was it you're kind of 
stuck together, so to say, so to speak, right. For, for, you know, a couple of weeks, if things go well, you know, you make metal rounds and things like what was, what was the unique part of that experience? Um, from my perspective, you know, I think yeah. I was kind of on that. I don't want to say outside looking in, but because those guys had all qualified before the year before. So I was trying to find my spot, see where to fit in, but mm -hmm. just seeing the caliber of basketball, you know, I think obviously, you know, uh, Steve was amazing during the tournament, but if you look at the team, everybody played up to their role mm. and, um, you know, I, Oh Jesus. Um, yeah, it was just, it was amazing. Like, and you know, for me, I'm sitting, <laughs> I had front row, front row seats. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, just uh, being able to watch that caliber of basketball and, you know, watch, um, you know, some of the European teams, the Yugoslavian team, obviously we played Australia first game and just seeing the talent and, and seeing how well they play. It's yeah, it was something special. But I think the thing about, at least the thing that I've learned over, you know, watching it and getting to know the FIBA game a little bit more is, the things that you're touching on are like vital because, and, and it was very apparent. We talked about it with Jay and other guys that have been on the show is that they're fully aware that maybe they didn't even take the 12 best talented players, but what Jay was trying to do was create what he thought would be the best and most competitive team and the close knit closest knit team. Right. And so you think of the guys that just qualified and you've got, you've got Melvin, you know, you've got Phil scrub and those kind of glue guys that, understand the FIBA game and are ready for it and also you know aren't going to cause a kerfuffle about hey like when am I getting in or am I going to get in at all you know so I think there's something to be said for yeah you had a front row seat but Jay and and the staff knew that all right well when it's when it's E's turn he's going to give it everything he has and if not he's going to go to sleep when everybody else does he's going to take care of his body like everyone else does and he's going to train and be prepared like everyone and I think when you have such a small window of time, that's such a huge thing. I, I'm just assuming. What are your thoughts about that? You know, I think you hit it right on the nail on the head there, right? Um, just look at this year. You know, you look, think of everybody thinks the, the U.S. is the, the best team in the world, most talented. And, you know, they go into a tournament like this. And sure, they might have a lot of talented players, but you can't just put a team together and in a couple of weeks think they're going to dominate, right? Totally. And that's, uh, you know, FIBA is different. It's a different style of play. And, um, you know, and, and I'm sure, you know, that played into, into me making the team, you know, I'm, um, I'm not going to cause any trouble. Um, you tell me what to do and, and I'm going to do it. Right. So I think that, that was probably, you know, one of the, one of the deciding factors I would assume. Would your wife say that that's still one of your qualities that you're do what you're told or have those times oh. changed? <laughs> <laughs> uh, you had to have to ask her on that one. Hey, <laughs> come say goodnight to my buddy Eric. Good hey, Eli, are you uh, going to bed now? Yes. Yeah, the guy. It's time for bed, right? It's school. It's school night. Mm -hmm. Right. Eight o'clock. Nice. Dad's oh, you have a good night's sleep, two. buddy, and have a good time at school. Say yeah. goodnight. Good night. Good night. Good, good night, buddy. buddy. Sleep tight. Okay. Love you. So times have changed, hey? Um, obviously yeah. not not putting any pressure on the J-Man and he's going to be who he is, but how cool is it to be a dad of a guy who just loves basketball and is willing to put in the work? Um, from a dad perspective, it's got to be kind of fun, hey? Yeah, you know what? It is fun. And, and you know, he deserves the accolades that he gets. He, he puts in the time and goes in and shoots in the morning, you know, goes up there, dribbles, does all this stuff by himself. And... You know, I, I, I was always, um, I told him, I said, you know what, I'm not going to force you to do anything. You, you right. do what, if you want to do it, you're going to do it, mm -hmm. but just do it because you want to do it. I know I didn't want to be that, that dad that said, you have to do this because I did it or, or vice versa. Right. So, yeah. um, it is, it's fun to watch and it's fun to see them, you know, succeed. It's, it sucks when they, they don't succeed and, you know, have bad games and stuff. But at the same time, that's parenting and, and you can learn from that. Right. So. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Before we let you go, buddy. Um, thanks for all your years that you put in for the program and everything you did. Uh, is there any hope 
in heck of us actually making it to Paris next summer? Do you think we are be allowed to go for a few days or, you know, you know what? or am I just going to have I, to take the ferry and sleep on your floor for a few days? And no, watch the games? no. You know what? Maybe, maybe that'll just be a surprise, right? I just, yeah. I'll just, uh, you know, the week before the games be yeah. like, Hey, I told you I was going tell the wife. Uh, I told you, didn't I tell you that last year? Hey, yeah. And just go over there. <laughs> so just, sorry, I'm going, I got to go to work. I like that. I, I, you know what I, the thing I brought up was like, I'm doing the subtle hint thing right now, you know, like the little drop, like, yeah, that'd be fun to go. Or, Hey, did you know it's on? Oh, Hey, did you know Canada qualified? And it's like, right now it's dead air. So yeah. like, I, yeah, that, that's actually not a bad strategy. No. You know what you do? Mm-hmm. You say, Hey, I told you I was going to go. Mm-hmm. And then just tell her, tell her you're going to go. And, and sh- Hey, don't air this one though. Just tell her you're going to go. And then when it comes time and you leave, you said, I told you last year I was going to go. And she might say, I thought you were joking. I wasn't joking. Hey. Okay. <laughs> oh, we're, we're airing that. I don't have to worry yeah. about her. I don't have to worry about her listening. Yeah. Fair enough. Yeah. That's a good one. Um, okay. No. Yeah. And if, uh, if you want to go, let's, let's do it. Let's make it happen. Okay? I love it. I love it. Yeah. I love it. Do you think what's Canada's last question? What's Canada's legit chance at a medal at the Olympics, not to put pressure. So many things can happen. These guys have seasons, but if all things are in a line, what hey, do you man, think? You, you look at the talent, talent level on that team, right? You got one, you know, in Shay, one of the, the top players in the world. Um, RJ, uh, the whole team is they, they bring something to the table. Um, I, I think they have a good shot, mm-hmm. right? You I know, would agree. They, I think that uh, I'd love to see it. I'm, and I'll be there cheering them on. Not there, probably, but we're watching the games anyways. And uh, you know what? That's uh, It's going to be fun to watch, and it's always something special. You got it, man. Thanks for being with us. 23 years in the making, 24 when they finally get the opportunity to tip off, and it's a super awesome thing and just brings so much pride. I feel like I've just been beaming for like a week here, just oh. feeling so Canadian, right? It's There's... I don't know what it is. I just, I just wish we said to a few of the other guys, just, I wish we cared this much about Canada basketball. Like people do the blue Jays or the Leafs or, yeah. the Kings, you know, it's uh, coming though. It's I coming, mm-hmm. right. It's coming. And, and, uh, you know, the more, the more people they get into it and, and start watching and supporting and it's like, uh, just keep rolling. Got it. Thanks for being with us, Matt. Appreciate you.